We start over. Small introduction. This week's parasha, obviously, as we just mentioned, is a two, two for one special. We have two parashiot. As Rashi tells us, is the last day of Moshe Rabbeinu's life, the final departing message to the Jewish nation. Says the Midrash Tanchuma that last week's parasha, we spoke about it a little bit, about the Klalot. There was 98 curses that Moshe Rabbeinu told the Jewish nation. 98. Now you can imagine, as Moshe Rabbeinu is telling them, this is the last day of my life. From here you're going to continue on. You're going to go into Israel. You're going to take over the land. You're going to go to war. You're going to take over the land. I'm no longer going to be here. And the Midrash relates it, that people were frightened. You can imagine after hearing 98 different klalot, different curses. Says the Midrash Tan Khuma, that Moshe Rabbeinu came to the nation and reassured them. He told them, don't worry. I know you're a little bit frightened right now. You heard those klalot last week. You heard those curses. He says, but just know, those klalot, those curses, quote unquote, will ultimately benefit you. How is it possible? What is Moshe Rabbeinu telling the nation over here? These klalot that you are so afraid of them, they're ultimately going to benefit you. We spoke a lot last week, why the klalot come down on a person? We said, Tachat asher lo Hashem besimcha u levav. That you didn't go in Hashem's ways, you didn't work Hashem in happiness and gladness of heart. And mainly, that's why these things come upon you. Moshe Rabbeinu tells them, just know these curses are the best thing for you. And I think if we dig deep into the words of Moshe Rabbeinu, we see a beautiful point. We see a beautiful message. Like this. I'll give you a parable, and I think from this parable we'll understand what Moshe Rabbeinu meant to tell the nation. There was a guy and his friends who lived in a mountainous region. He was in a real place where there was a lot of mountains. And these friends, they love to go hiking. Every weekend, what they like to do, they get their boots on, they get their book bags on with the cap and the little straw around, and you know, the whole day they're sucking like a mutzetz, and they go and they're hiking for the day. And they would go out. Every weekend they would go out hiking. Every weekend, every weekend, hiking, 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 hiking. And they would see all the different places. And Baruch Hashem, they had a lot of mountainous places to go. And one week as they were walking, they're walking along the way, they see like a trail, and the beginning of the trail they see two trees, and in front of the trees they see a caution tape, taped up by the trees. Yeah, don't, do, not, do not enter. So the first day they see it, they say, okay, okay, big deal. So we have all the places to go. Time after time, they keep on passing these caution tape, and they see it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And what do they say in, uh, over here in America? Curiosity killed the cat. Miskin, not the cat. Eventually, they themselves, you know what? We have to figure out what's going on over here. Caution tape. Let's go see. They go underneath, around the tape, and they start going up the trail. They start going up, and up, and up, and up. And next thing they see, they see barricades, like orange, those plastic orange barricades. Yeah, no, do not enter. Warning. Don't continue. But, you know, we already started this mile. We're already on the way. Let's continue. We already made the jump. Let's continue. They keep going. They go another few couple thousand feet, or whatever, hundred feet, whatever it was. And they see over there barbed wire wrapped around a tree. Yeah, no, do not enter. What do they do? They go around and find their way in. They keep going, keep going. What do they see next? Electrified wires. You touch it. No, don't go. Please, Habibi, stop. It's actually funny because I didn't write it down over here. But when I... I'm reminded of a story now. A few weeks ago, I don't know who remembers, I went away and one week we didn't have a class. So I went my family to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Over there, as we were driving on the highway, it's very common to see a lot of horses. We saw over there these beautifully majestic horses, big, this, that. So my son tells me, Abba, Abba, pull over, I want to see. I pull over the car, and my son is three years old. I pull over to the car, I go over to the side. Now my son gets out of the car, we go over to the side of the road. Now my son is holding on and looking on to the, to the horses. And now a minute, minute and a half passes by, and I'm like, okay, Jacob, let's go. I touch the wires, it zaps me. And I only ran and realized electric, electrified wires. My son was holding it for a minute and a half. <laughs> Came into the car, said, Mama, I don't know what kind of kid you brought to the world. This is not a, this is not a human being, this is Superman. <laughs> a minute, 30, no, nothing. Then it be nothing <laughs> the whole time. They see the electric wires. They say, yeah, let's keep going. And they keep going. A few more, a few more feet, a few more feet, a few more feet. They keep going, keep going, keep going. Now, unbeknownst to them, the owner of the property put over their bear traps. 
And they're walking, they're walking, they're walking. All of a sudden, they hear, <laughs> one of the bears snaps, snaps. Happened to be the guy, he didn't get his foot in it, but it went right next to his foot and got, it caught his foot and caused a big gash. His friends were like came over to him, they put bandages on him, they said, are you okay? He's like, yeah, yeah, don't worry, I'll be okay, it's normal, I'll be all right. He tries to get up, he's like, hey, no, I can't, I can't keep on going. So one of the friends says, you know what, I'll volunteer, I'll stay with him. You guys go, we'll wait here. When you guys, after you're finishing the trail, just come back and get us. Okay? The friends say, no problem, they put on their bags, they get ready to go. They say, we'll see you guys later, and they leave. Two friends are sitting down. Now the guy who got caught on the food, he's saying to him, he talks to his, look at his friend, he says, honestly, if you ask me, I really don't know what's going on with the guy who owns this property. He's a little bit over-exaggerated. Caution tape, this, barbed wires, electric, bear traps. What does the guy want from us? Okay, we got the point the first time. Caution tapes, bear, how much are you going to put over here? Bear traps? The guy's my mash He's like over-exaggerating. His friend looks at him and says, you honestly, you're right. It's very strange. I don't know why so, so many different obstacles. An hour passes. Two hours pass. Three hours pass. Four hours pass. And now these two are starting to get worried. Where are these guys? It should have been a long time ago. They should have been back already. Five hours. Six hours. They realize, okay, we got to get out of here. The guy's like, tries to get up. He can't walk. His friend's like, don't worry. Come. Puts him on his shoulder and start walking together and he brings him down. Slowly he brings him down and they get down and as soon as they get down the mountain, what do they see? They see two deputy sheriffs waiting at the bottom of the mountain. They tell the deputy sheriffs, they say to them, they see them, right away they run to them, excuse me, officer, please, do you mind, can you help my friends, we don't know what happened to them, we left them six hours ago, they continued on the trail. As soon as they tell the officers, our friends, they continued on the trail, the officer's expression changes. It went from, uh, what are you guys doing over here? And they saw the expression on his face go down as if it was, as if it was like a, a, an apologetic look. And the officer looks down and he tells him, look, I don't know how to tell you this. About an hour ago, we got a phone call from one of the houses in this neighborhood. They heard screaming from their backyard. She came out to the backyard and she saw that the screaming was coming from far away. She took out her binoculars. And she looked and she watched all five of your friends get mauled by a hen of bears. A den of bears. And only then the friends realized what all the warning signs were. What Moshe Rabbeinu is telling them? You hear these curses and you think it's the worst thing in the whole entire world for you. But you don't realize these curses are not over here to be a punishment for you. They're over here to stop you from going the wrong way. They're over here to correct you. They're over here to put you on the right route. It's like, you know, I remember, I said this over before, but when my first kid was born, when Leah was born, about five years ago, I was about uh, 200 pounds. No muscle, just 200 pounds. Shaman. Huh? Shaman, yeah. Have you said it, have you said it for me? Yeah? 200 pounds. And I remember, I went to the doctor. Then the doctor comes, you know, routine checkup, I get on the scale. I'm standing on the scale, he's doing the numbers, he's like, you know, 100, 30, no, 150, 30, no. <laughs> you know, he, he keep on clicking the thing up until he gets to 196. He looks at me, okay? Looks at me, he goes, how old are you? I tell him my age. He goes, how tall are you? I'm like, six foot three. <laughs> no, no, I won't disclose it on the video, but. <laughs> I just say the video makes you look taller. No, six foot two, six foot three. Right? So I tell him my height. Whatever, you know. I tell him my height. He pulls out a chart. Now he shows me on the chart. He sees over here you have your age, you have your uh, height, and you have the weight. And it goes over into the, into the different brackets. You have green, yellow, orange, and red. Red is young, morbidly obese, because, you know. Guy goes to me and says, which age? What do you think? Yellow, green, orange, red. He shows me I'm in the red. I said, doctor, you're over-exaggerating. You're over, come on, obese? I don't know, maybe I'm a little bit, I put on a little bit pounds, but obese, you're over-exaggerating. And automatically in my head, I started telling myself excuses. You know, no, the scale doesn't know me. You know, the, the chart doesn't know me. My bones are very heavy. <laughs> I carry more water than other people. <laughs> Everything does not just done myself. And the doctor tells me, look, at the end of the day, you could do whatever you want. Uh, it doesn't change my life one way or another. He's like, but I'm telling you this. 
If you continue down this route, being the age you are, the weight you are, and he pulls out a list of all the health risks that can come my way. Heart pressure, this, that, diabetes. Uh, he said, and then the last at the bottom of the list, cancer. Oh, oh, as soon as I saw that, I said to myself, okay, you know what? I got to change my ways. I got to wake up. And then started a diet. Three months later, I was 30 pounds on there. I lost 30 pounds, three months. If you want the plan, sign up to my program. <laughs> uh, fitness by Rabbi Bendel. <laughs> three months, 30 pounds. But sometimes in life, a person needs to be told, look, if you're going to continue, they say, what's going to happen? If you continue like this, you're going to bring upon yourself the real curse. Me telling you right now, oh, the, it's only me giving you the warning signs. It's me telling you you can stop. So you can tell you to stop. It's like, imagine right now you're driving, and you want to go to Florida, and you're driving and you're driving, and you see a sign on the end of the road that says, oh, another 500 miles, Canada. Oh, oh, wait a minute, I'm going the wrong direction. <laughs> Make a quick U-turn. I say, I'm telling you, you're going the wrong direction. Make a U-turn, Habibi. Make a U-turn. Make a U-turn. Hashem gives you these little warning signs. Tells you, ah, it's time to wake up. A smoker, for example. Not vapes. Yeah, other one's going to go crazy over here. A smoker of cigarettes. I got to smoke cigarettes. Yeah? A guy who smokes a pack of cigarettes religiously. Two packs of cigarettes every single day. Like a chimney. You tell him, Habibi, you're hooked. Me? <laughs> Anytime I want, Habibi, I get rid of all these cigarettes right now. Yeah, watch me. Yeah, watch me, watch me. No, I just don't want to. Yeah, I'm not hooked. And you tell them, and you tell them, and you tell them, and you tell them. And they don't learn sometimes. The majority of the smokers, what do they do? They continue, continue, continue until either, God forbid, it's too late, or if they hear a crazy story that happened to somebody they know, and something happened to them, and then they wake up. Sometimes in life, we need a wake up call to remind us to change our ways, to change our path. Moshe Rabbeinu was telling them, don't see right now, you see this darkness, you see this cloud, you think that these bad things are for you, these are just Hashem giving you a warning sign. You think if you're going to continue the way you continue, you're going to bring you happiness? You think if you continue this way, Hashem, you're going to have happiness in life? All of these curses come down to a person for not going in the ways of Hashem. For going away. What is Hashem telling them? Not because Hashem needs you to go in His ways. Hashem is telling you, if you're not going to do it, you're going to bring upon yourself these curses. Nothing to do with me. Me telling you this is just telling you, hey, you need to change your ways. You need to go on a diet. You need to, put, you need to take off the weight. Whatever it is. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu is telling the Jewish. He's telling them. Right now you see this. Right now you're going through this. And you think to yourself, oh, what after all this? What's this? What's this? all these curses? What's all this hardship? What's all these dumb times? And Moshe Rabbeinu says, don't be afraid of these things because this is Hashem ultimately saving you. And Arki Dekach, let's see what the Bet Levi says. The Bet Levi, in a Sefer on Bitachon, he writes like this. He says, how is a person who is an ayashal, an upright person, how is he supposed to act in a time when suffering comes down on him? Yeah? He says like this. This is the guideline. This is the Torah of a person, of an upright person, when he encounters suffering, dark shit, or God forbid, a lack of prosperity, sustenance, money, whatever it is. This is what he says. Beautiful message. What's the first thing you think when you say to yourself, look, I'm at work right now, I work eight hours a day. And unfortunately, you know, I'm not making as much money as I need, and the situation is a little bit down. What's the first thing a person thinks to himself in his head? I need to work more. I need to do more. I need to take a second job, right? That's what logic dictates. You need to make more money, work more hours. You need to make more money, you get a second job. Look what the Bet Levi writes. He says, he should not, not, should not increase his ishtadut. Don't increase the amount of times you work. You're doing the, you're doing the normal, you're doing eight hours, you're doing whatever needs to be done. Don't think you need to increase it right now. It's like this. Rather, what should he do? He should look into his ways, take a step back. What's happening over here that's causing this to happen to me? What am I doing that's bringing this upon myself? Like we see the Gemara, Masech HaVachot says, if a person sees, he sees that suffering is coming upon him, what's the first thing he needs to do? To check his ways. Listen to this. The Ben Yehoyada, the Ben Yishchai, he writes, what is this when a person sees that suffering is coming his way? When a person is in suffering, what he sees that suffering is coming his way, explains the Ben Yehoyada, explains the Ben Yishchai, that a Kroshba who gives you warning signs before the real suffering comes. And that's what it means, Ben Adam Shoe, when he sees that, that suffering is on his way, when he's driving and he sees Canada another 500 miles. Hashem's telling him, you make a U-turn, you're going the wrong way. 
Hashem is telling you right now, it's time for you to go look into your actions. You know, Chazal teach that a person every morning in heaven, the amount of uh, all, the amount of yoke, the amount of burden he'll have in a day is already nixal on him. He's already written down on him. In Shemaim, how much? <coughs> Where it's going to come from? Not so clear. Sometimes it comes from work, sometimes it comes from here. Some people it comes from their wife. Right? I'll tell you a story that I heard somebody. For years, on Shabbat night, this is famous, um, the man comes home, he sings to the wife, he sings, a, who, a woman of valor will find. In this household, the woman came home every Friday night and she would sing to the other, fryer, me, <laughs> the husband was a sucker, who's gonna find? I found him, here he is, he washes the dishes. Yeah? <laughs> this guy, everything his wife said, Amen Ishti, Amen Ishti, which is by the way, between me and you, that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah? And he says one day, he calls his friends. I always talk about it in the past. What's the worst thing to do when you're, when you're, when you're in trouble with somebody? Call the friends. Now this is the happy you are. Ah, uh, okay. He comes home one day. Zel, I need a shalat to buy it. I'm the one in control over you. You're not going to do this to me anymore. I'm going to be in control. This, that, that. She's like, well, oh, huh? She starts crying. She goes to this. He's like, no, I'm putting my foot down. The next day, he goes to work. The whole business is you know, one problem here, one problem here, one problem here. For three, four days it's happening. The business is in shambles. He calls the rabbi. He says, Rabbi, what's going on over here? Five days, the business is not operating like it's supposed to be. Every time I go, every corner, another problem. The rabbi tells him what happened five days ago. Rabbi, that was it. I came home, couldn't do it anymore. I need to go I'm the one who's going to be in control of the house. So the rabbi told him, look, what do you think? You think you're going to drop it from there? It's not going to come from somewhere else. You think you're going to drop the burden? Tagit Baruch Hashem. Your wife comes home, she tells you, how come you didn't put the socks away? How come you didn't do laundry? How come this? How come that? But tell her, Baruch Hashem, thank you so much, honey. Thank you so much. Right now you're giving me a little burden. That way the business is going smooth. Huh? If I come to you a week before and I would have told you, you would have told me, better you bring it from the wife than you bring it from the business. So she gives you the hard time. Understand, she's the mekor of the bacha. She's the source of the blessing. Ezer kenegdo. Help her against him. How could you help her against him? Because by being against him, she's a helper. The wife pushes you to become a better person. Sometimes enough we need to be pushed. Sometimes enough we need to hear. We need to be pushed. We need to be to get a better person. A man needs to be pushed. Sometimes also a woman. Hashem says, Moshe Rabbeinu is talking to the Jewish nation. He says, don't be afraid when you hear these things. This is a Kodesh Baruch giving you a push for you to take it to the next level. For you to become the best version of yourself. You hear something's coming along the way. Tell, oh, eh? you see something's coming. Look at your actions. Wait a minute. What did I do? What's going on right now in my life? Why would this come down to me right now? No, everything will get will make sense in the end. And a similar note says the stipler gone. There's a Gemara in Masechet Brachot, another Gemara. That Gemara says three different things a person needs to pray, needs to have mercy for them. What does it mean? Rashi explains he needs to pray for mercy for them to come down. What are the three things the Gemara says? A good, a good king, a good ruler. You need to pray for it. Why is the Pasuki Mishra? It says, it says, Yad, Lev Melech, Beyad Hashem. The heart of a king is in the, in, the, in, the, in the hands of Hashem. So for a good king, you have to pray strong to have a lot of mercy that Hashem is going to give someone who's going to be able to properly rule over us. Yeah? The second thing, a good year. How do we know a good year? There's a pasuk in the Torah that says, Ene Hashem, the eyes of Hashem, are constantly on it. What are you talking about? The land of Israel. From the beginning until the end. Says the Gemara, what does it mean from the beginning of the end until the end, until the beginning of the land to the end of the land? What does it mean? I mean, beginning of the year until the end of the year. Says the Gemara, it means to teach you that whatever Hashem decrees in the beginning of the year, that's what's going to be the rest of the year. One week from today, we have Rosh Hashanah coming on us. We want to have a good year. We want to have a good year written down. This is Hashem saying, right now is the time for you to pray for mercy. Right now is the time for you to open up your heart, to pray to Hashem, give me a good year. Arkidekach, we see when a person has downtime, when God forbid something happens to him, first thing he does, picks up his phone and he calls. Calls his mom, calls his friends, calls his brother, calls his, everyone he knows, he calls them to tell them about his tawat. But there's one person he forgets to call. Hashem Ibarach. He forgets to call Hashem. He forgets to call Hashem. We'll see in a minute why this is so important. We see why this concept is so important in a minute. The third thing, it says, it's a good dream. It says the Gemara, a good dream. A good dream, a person to pray for mercy. Then later on in the Gemara, listen to this. Rav Chizda says, a bad dream is preferable to a good dream. It's better to have a bad dream than a good dream. 
Huh? Imagine someone come to you now. Yeah, I love when I have scary dreams. The worst, man. I love it. <laughs> it's the best thing in the world. Nah, those dreams when I'm a millionaire driving around a Bentley. I hate it. I like the scary... I'm in the middle of a cemetery in the middle of the night. Smoke everywhere. <laughs> you know, uh, murderers are chasing after me. That's my favorite dream. <laughs> you guys, you guys got to send them into the psychic ward. <laughs> no? What's going on over here? Excuse me. 911, we have a crazy man. <laughs> Says of Chizda, a bad dream is preferable to a good dream. Says Rashi, why? Because a bad dream wakes up your heart to do tshuva. You wake up from a bad dream, you have a little bit of fighting, it wakes you up. Okay, maybe I need to, to change something. Maybe I need to wake, change my ways. Maybe I need to do something more. Maybe I need to take upon myself something else. And it says more than that like this. He says the anguish, the pain, the anxiety that you have from a bad dream within itself is mechaper on it. You wake up, you have anxiety. Just that anxiety you feel for the dream already is mechaper the dream. Also, it says something nice, side note. It says that on... A dream that's unanswered is like an unopened letter. Like Hashem is talking to you and you didn't open the letter. Mama, the letter came to you, didn't open it. Not every dream. Certain dreams, certain different halakhot. But long story short, what's going on over here? We see a very important concept. He's telling us something simple. That sometimes in life, a bad dream is referable to a good dream. Why? Because it wakes us up. He says, you know what? Stop making a move. Go in the right direction. Wake up, wake up, wake up. A guy who has a business... And says, you know what, that's it. I'm taking it easy on the business. One day he gets an eviction letter in the mail. An eviction letter is a good thing or a bad thing? Depends how he takes it. Okay, you know what, I'm done. And gets up and he leaves. No problem, it's a terrible thing for him. He says, you know what, this is a motivation for me to get up and do better. A year later, the business is booming. Sometimes in life we need to see this, quote unquote, this eviction letter for us to wake up. It's a bad dream. This is what the stapler Rav says. He says the stapler Rav, he said, it's like when a person goes to the doctor. And the doctor tells him, I see something is off over here. I want to send you for different tests. The guy says, what, what do you mean? He says, look, I can't, I, I can't pinpoint it right now. But I feel like there's something that's a little bit off over here. I want to send you the test. He goes and proceeds for the next two months to send this guy to a different doctor, a different doctor, a different doctor, a different checkup, a different checkup, <laughs> back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. After a month's time, all the tests come out positive. Everything's good. Baruch Hashem, no problems. Because the doctor says, what's going on with you? The stamp says, this sometimes in our life, this is how it seems. Akash Baruch Hu gives us, oh, wait a minute, something's going on over here? Go to this gate, go to this place. Just the anguish that you feel in that moment of worriedness takes away the disease that could be coming along the way. Takes it away. It says, when you see these things, don't be afraid. Don't come and be frightened now. And it says more than that. It says, Abete Levi, so what should you do if God forbid it comes upon you? He says, he should pour out his heart in supplications to Hashem. Pray to Hashem. Like we see, it says in Gilam Masechi Nida, if a person wants to be rich, you want, to, you, want to be, you want advice to be rich? Everyone in this room wants to be rich? I'll give you advice. It says in Gilam Masechi Nida, a person wants to be rich, what does he need to do? It says, pray to the one that all the riches and all the transactions and all the land in the world belong to. Who is that? Hashem in Barach. In your life, when you're going through suffering, what's the first thing you do? We saw it a few minutes ago. Call your friend, call your mother, call this one, call that one. Who you don't call? You don't call Hashem. Hashem is the only one who can help you, and that's the only person you don't call. Not Stam, Rosh Hashanah, we read about two different uh, women. We read about Sarah Emenu, and we read about the Haftorah Chana. Two different women that were barren and couldn't have children. And both of them prayed and got children. What's the connection? Why, why do we read this in Rosh Hashanah? Hashem is telling us a beautiful point. He's saying, you want anything you have, you have to pray. How do you have to pray? In a way where you understand that there's no one else in the world that can bring you what you need except for Hashem. Says the Bet Levi, right now, you think we're in Salichot, let's say. The guy says, you know what, I'm not going to wake up for Salichot. I'm tired, it's day, it's another hour, I have to go to work. I have another hour of work, I'm going to miss out for work, I'm going to be tired. Says the Bet Levi, when it sometimes comes to you, you have a lack of sustenance, prosperity coming to your way, don't increase in your ishtadlut. You think that if you're going to go work more hours, if you're going to give up uh, an hour for work to go sell you're going to lose? Whether or not that deal closes is in Hashem's hands. Whether or not you get that deal done is in Hashem's hands. Arki Dekach says the Peleoets, says the Peleoets like this. He says, every single person in the world has to learn from the Avot. The forefathers, their character traits are passed down to us. So much so that Akash Bahu is Midagdek with them, was so meticulous with them. That every little thing they did, he was very meticulous with them. Why? Because it was passed down to us. 
Many different mafarshim bring down the whole reason we went out to Mitzrayim was because for one second the lack of that from Avraham Avinu, we had to go down to Paro, clean that second of that out of from us. 210 years, then the desert, everything we had to go through was just to clean a second of, of, of lack of belief in Hashem. Says the Peleo Eitz, we have to learn from Yaakov Avinu. Why? When his brother Esav came to, to go to war with him, what did he do? He did three things. First things first, he sent presents. Second thing he did, prayed. Third thing he did, prepared for war. Yeah? Here's Rav Chaim Vital, a beautiful point. He says, when Yaakov Avinu was preparing for war, he was praying. He was doing them simultaneously. Not that he was praying and then he prepared for war. Meaning to say, even when he was doing his shalut, even when he was doing his efforts, I'm doing my part, he was praying to Hashem in those moments. Because he knows that if Hashem doesn't want, even my efforts won't have any value. A guy says, you know, I go, I pray in the morning, I pray in the night, I pray in the evening, but when he's at work, and, and, and God, nobody, <laughs> I'm at work now, and there's no God. Rav Chaim Vitan is telling us, when you're at work, that's when you're supposed to be praying. When you sit in front of the computer screen, you have a client on the phone, that's when you're supposed to be praying. No, I'm hacking him up. Yeah, you heard about the game last week? Yeah, the Jets, the this, the that. That's why Mr. Shewer. Yeah, right. <laughs> now we know. huh? The Jets, the this one, the Mets, the this, the that. Yeah. And he's hacking the guy up. And the guy's like, yeah, oh yeah, the weekends I go fishing on my boat. And he starts talking to him about tequila and whiskey and LeBron James and Stephen Curry. Hacking the guy up. How does he feel in his heart? Wow, I'm doing a great job. I'm going to win this guy over. What's he supposed to feel in his heart? Says the Vital. In that moment, he needs to be saying in his heart, Hashem, if it's, if it's not you, not me. I'm not going to happen. This deal is not closing unless you're going to give it to me. I can hack from today until tomorrow. I can talk about the brand, Steph, everybody who wanted the whole entire world. The lawyer has a friend of mine works in sales. He told me one time he had a client on the phone. He thought he was going to get him good. Yeah, gets him on the phone. He starts talking to him. Everything he brought up. The guy's like, well, I love fishing. I hate fishing. <laughs> you watch basketball? Actually, no, I like soccer. <laughs> Everything on the phone. You think that when you talk to the guy on the phone, you talk about this, you forget. Who puts it into his heart to be in the same thing that you are? Ooh. You have to pray in those moments when you're in Avodah, when you're working, when you're doing the Peulot, when you're doing your effort. That's what you're supposed to be praying. That's what he says, Hashem. Hashem, I know that if you're not going to be here with me right now, there's not going to be any Atzlacha. There's not going to be any success. I won't close a deal without you. I won't win you without you. Every single one of us is taken away. A guy says now, ah, Sadiqot, this, that, take away from work. Afuch! You go to Sadiqot, you take care of what you need to do before Shana, so that next year you can have a lot more money in the bank. The Peleuets is not one person in the world. I'm speaking other Peleuets, the Bet Levi. Now one person in the world can take away what Hashem decreed upon him, can bring it further, or can bring it closer. If Hashem decreed you're going to make X amount of money that year, you're going to make it. Not this big fish, not this client, not this guy. No one can bring it further. Nobody can take it away. Nobody can bring it closer. Nobody can increase it. No one can decrease it. It's yours. When you understand that when you're coming to pray, all the people in the world you're going to talk to are not going to help you. If you're not coming to Hashem, it's Barach. If you're not coming to Hashem, so right now it's going to you right now. Something's happening. You're calling this one away. Who's going to help me? Who's going to help me? Hashem says, wake up and make the right phone call. Now it's time for you to call. Who? Call me. Because I'm the only one who can help you. You want to be sheer? Go to, go to, want to be rich? Go to the one who owns all the money. You want to be successful? Go to the one that all the success belongs to. You want to have health? Go to the one that all the health belongs to. You want to be healed? Go to the one who all the healing belongs to. And so on and so forth. Hashem, everything is in His hands. There's nothing you cannot do. Everything is there for you. But when you pray to Him without understanding, when you come to Him, you tell him, Hashem, I understand. Everything is from you. I can work 100 hours a day and I won't make a dollar more if you don't decree it on me. Everyone's making mama team next year. I got this fish right now. I'm working on him for next year. I'm going to get him into the books. He's going to be my client forever. You think? All the efforts you do have no value if Hashem doesn't want them to. Now comes Rosh Hashem says, you have your whole year in front of you in your hands right now. You have everything in front of you in your hands right now. Show me what's important. You want to go now and say, okay, you know what? The next week, no, I'm not going to. No, leave me alone, Sadiqot. Leave me alone this. Leave me alone prayer. Leave me alone. Not, I don't want nothing to do with Rosh Hashanah. When I get there, I'll deal with it. Right now, I want to work. Comes Rosh Hashanah, the guy already is uh, 30 minutes before the holiday, he comes home. Because he, he, God forbid, he leaves work 20 minutes early. It shows you where his priority is. He, he thinks that, where's the one where's the he come from? From me. And it's completely the opposite. Rosh Hashanah is the day you can pray for whatever you want. 
It's a day that the Shemaim is open. Hashem says, whatever you want, it's in your hands. Come and pray. Come and talk to me. But not just come and talk to me. Come and talk to me in a way where you understand that there's no one else in the world that can give you what you need except for me. You can go turn to him and turn to him and call this one and call that one. No one will help you if I don't want it to be. So when you're driving and you see the sign 500 miles Canada and you say, you know what, let me call my friend. Who are you going to call? Make a U-turn. No, no, no. I call AAA. I call AAA. Where are you trying to go? Florida or Canada? It's getting chilly. Okay, you're going the wrong direction. I'm a chashavta. Oh, I'm getting warmer. Hashem says sometimes in life I give you these signs, but they're only for one thing. If you take a step back and realize, wait a minute. Why is this happening to me? Can you hear Seems to be Hashem wants me to turn around and pray to him. Seems to be Hashem wants me to open it up. The Imam says, why did Hashem make the imaot? The Torah was already created. Why did he make them pray to not be barren? He made them barren. For what reason? For what reason did he make them pray? He already knew they were going to have children. He tells Abraham, from Sarah, you're going to have children. So why is she barren? Huh? From Rika, you're going to have children. Why is she barren? From Rachel. Why is she? I don't understand what's going on over here. All these women are barren. Why? You ready? It says the Gemara that the tefillah of the tzaddikim, the prayers of the righteous people, are Hashem he loves them. And in life, for you to bring it down, Hashem wants you to come. He wants you to pray. He wants you to ask. He wants you to understand where everything comes from. Abba can deposit into your into account every month a thousand dollars. It's not the same thing like when you come and you ask him, Abba can give me a thousand dollars. You know why? Because when you come and you put your hand out, you know where the money is coming from. When you just deposit it into your account, you don't feel it. It's already automatic. You just swipe the CC, you swipe the credit card. When Hashem says, all I want you to do is put your hand down. Come Rosh Hashanah. Now's the time to put your hand down. Hashem, next year like this. I said, obviously, last week, don't come with the Amazon shopping list. Yes? Again, we appreciate everything you have. But it's okay to also ask for more. But understand that if you want something in the next year, if you want something to happen, if you want something to come your way, there's only one way to get it. This is the better living. Call Hashem. Speak to Hashem. And like this. It says, Sefer Nefesh Achaim, anyone who finds himself in distress, contemplates on the word en od milvado there's no one else except for Hashem and just these words have the ability to be Moshiach to save you Arkedekach the grandson of the Bet Levi the Briskarov he lived in Europe in the times of, of the Holocaust during World War II he was with his children and they wanted to flee the country they got onto a train and the kids come to their father and say, Abba, we don't have the proper paperwork. If they're going to catch us, they're going to throw us back. The briskarov looks at his kids and he tells them, contemplate in your mind the words, En od milvado. There's nothing else but him, Hashem. Don't worry, we'll be okay. An hour, two hours pass. All of a sudden, they see the guy from the train conductor coming to check the paperwork of the people. Visas, this, that. And he sees them approaching them. And the kids are like, what's going on over here? What's going to be? And the kids realize, they stop thinking about Enon Mivado. They stop having this in their mind. All of a sudden they said, you know, one second, Enon Mivado, Enon Mivado, Enon Mivado. The, crank, the train conductor just walked past them and they didn't exist. Real story. Just these words, when you understand, when you're on the phone with a client, when you're on the phone with somebody, when something is coming your way, when you're on the phone with your accountant this year and tells you, look, <laughs> this is what you offer here in taxes, Enon Mivado. <laughs> <laughs> just these words to understand that everything comes from Hashem has the ability to save you, to redeem you. Just this understanding that everything comes from Hashem, just to say these words, has the ability to save you. It says if you need, ever find yourself in a situation, and old milvado, back and forth and back and forth in your mind, put it in your mind, ingrain it into your mind. And like this, we have to understand that sometimes Hashem speaks to us to Tzahot. He speaks to us sometimes through the difficult times. Why? Says the Chafetz Chaim, he writes in his Sefer. He writes that one time in his time, there was a very strong earthquake that hit Japan. He wrote in his Sefer, this was a message from Hashem to the Jewish nation. To wake up. Mimele, we see a clear proof. The Chafetz Chaim is telling us 
the way Hashem operates is the world is Hashem directly talking to you. If the last year wasn't a proof, how much Hashem is talking to us? How much He says, this Rosh Hashanah, come into it differently. Come with a different mindset, come in ready, come in prepared. Don't think it was like what it was last year. This year. But I'll tell you, the Imam Sekh Rosh Hashanah says, any year that started Be'oni, in poorness, with wickedness, with hardship, so far, its end will be in Oshir. I said this over on Tuesday class. One guy said, I said, we're going to see you next week. We have some time. The guy says, what do you mean? The beepers, the radios. I said, oh, you're right. I didn't think about it. <laughs> well, that's the truth. And who knows what's going to be? But with Hashem, we see the whole thing changed. Kosh Bahu in one minute can be, change everything. And it doesn't take a lot. This is exactly what Moshe Rabbeinu was telling them. And like this. I'll tell you right now like this. The Midrash Gadol relates that in this week's parasha, it tells us the mitzvah of tshuva. Moshe tells them you have a mitzvah lashuv, to return to Hashem. You have a mitzvah from the Torah to come back to Hashem. And he tells them like this. It will be when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, I have presented it before you, then you will take it to your heart and you will return to Hashem. Your God, and listen to His voice and with all your heart and your soul, then Hashem, Hashem your God will bring you back. Says the Midrash, Hagadol, at this moment, the Jewish nation asked him, how do we know Hashem will accept us? And Moshe Rabbeinu answered him and says, Cain killed his brother in cold-blooded murder and Hashem forgave him. You think he won't forgive you? You think he won't forgive you? How do you do it? Tshuva. Hashem, please, open your mouth, pray, repent. Hashem will anything. Arkidekach, how much do you need? The Gemara Masechah Kiddushin says, a person comes up to a girl right now and tells her, Behold, you are betrothed to me, Al menat, on the condition that I'm completely a tzaddik. Who can say such a thing? Imagine I come to a woman now and I tell her, Look, right now you're my wife on condition that I have a hundred million in the account. <laughs> they look into the account, there's no hundred million. Okay, the condition doesn't fit. He tells the condition that I'm a tzaddik, I'm a hundred percent righteous. They said you have to give her a get. You have to give her a get. Maybe she's married. Why? Chazal answer, Shema Hirer Belibo. That maybe when he said the words that I'm Tzadik Gamu, that I'm completely righteous, that maybe he had a thought in his heart for one moment of tshuva, and at that moment he became Tzadik Gamu. Hashem is not expecting a lot from you. It could be one small thing in your heart, one small tiny energy, one small movement, one small thought, something small, something small, just a feeling, a want, a ratzon. Hashem says, that's enough for me. Now you can be Tzadik Gamu. What does Hashem want for us? To make the first step. To take the messages. To understand, look, Hashem is talking to us. He wants us to wake up. He wants us to come back. He wants us, he wants us to come back to Him. He wants us to make the people Lord. He wants us to make us move. And I'll finish with this. There's a pasuk in the, in the Nevi'im, in Micha, that says, Al tismachi oivati, ki li, ki nafalti, kamti, ki yeshev b'choshech, amunai, oli. It says like this, do not be happy, my enemy, that you see that I fell, I fell down. Because I'll get up. Right now I sit in the darkness, Hashem is my light. That's what it says in the Pasuk. The Malbim says like this. He says, do not rejoice, my enemy. Do not be happy that I'm in, in suffering. Because through this suffering, I'll come up. Through this dark ship, this darkness, I'll come up. Aki Dekach says, same, similar note says, that if it wasn't for the suffering, there wouldn't be the rise. If it wasn't for this darkness, there wouldn't be the all. Hashem, sometimes in his life, he wants to take you up, he wants to bring you up, he wants to take you to the next place. Sometimes it comes through a, a, a down. Right now, you in the fight, you came down, you fell. Just know this Nefilah was so Aliyah. This down that you fell right now was all for the purpose of bringing you up even higher than you were before. Just that you're sitting down in darkness now is all on the purpose of Hashem wants to bring you to even greater light. Bring you to a higher place. And I'll finish with this story like this. There was a story, I said this over before in the class, but I think the point really rings deep for the days of Hashem. The story goes like this. There was a rab rabbi in Israel. This rabbi happened to be that his daughter was not feeling well. And he took his daughter to the hospital. She was in the hospital, and in, in those times, even today, it's common that they put two people in one room with a curtain in between them. So he was there with his daughter on one side, and on the other side was this other woman with her daughter, on the other side. And he sees them over there, 
and the situation of the mother with her with her with her son, Michiela, with her son, was much more dire. The kid was like in an adus coma bamash. Very bad situation. And the rabbi testified to what he saw over there in the last, in the few days that he was there. He says, one day, the doctor walks into the room, he comes to the mother, and this guy, he says, look, the rabbi says, I saw the woman, she had nothing to do with religion, she wasn't a religious woman, nothing to do with religion, just a regular Jewish woman. The doctor comes over there, he tells her, look, I don't know how to tell you this, but clinically speaking, your son is no longer with us. As she hears, Ma, my son is no longer here. She starts getting a panic attack. And she starts screaming out, Ma, no, no. Now the whole hospital is going, what's going on? The guys come and trying to hold her back. They're trying to take, she goes out to the hallway, she's screaming, she's getting frantic. Everybody's following her, trying to see what's going on. The rabbi also follows to see what's going to be with this woman. She runs out to the parking lot. She's standing in the parking lot and a group of people are surrounding her and she stands in the middle of the circle as if it's only her and Hashem. And she screams out and she says, Abba! Abba! I have nowhere else to go. Only you can save me. You gave me the son, you save him. I know what you want from me. I know what you're asking from me. She took upon herself something in that moment to change for her year. This, from now on, I'm going to do this. A nurse came running outside and told her your son woke up. Sometimes in life, we have these moments. But Hashem wants you to understand from this moment, you're going to rise. You're going to reach another level. You're going to reach a higher level. And more than that, there's no tefillah in the world like a tefillah when a person understands that you have nowhere else to turn to Hashem. Hashem says, you're coming to me. There's no other turn. Now I'm going to give you the Yeshua. Now I'll, be the, now I'll give you everything. I'll give you everything. But understand, you're coming to Rosh Hashanah. Hashem wants from you one thing. Understand that your whole entire year is standing in your hand. And there's only one person who can change it. There's only one person who can make it better. There's only one person who can give you the things that you want. There's only one thing that can give you what you want. It's Hashem Yidbarach. So when you're going through the suffering, when you're going through the tough times, pick up the phone and only make one phone call. Yud ke vav ke. Hashem itbarach. Kol Hashem. And Hashem will be Moshe Otano. And this is Mary will all be zuchay to be written and stamped in a healthy new year. Can you tell me no more? Amen. Zakubahu.